Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin today's show with Afghanistan, a predominantly Muslim country where the lives of minorities have become increasingly unsafe owing to targeted attacks being carried out against them by motivated groups and terrorist organizations working on Islamabad payroll. In one such recent incident, as many as 21 people, most of whom were Sikhs and Hindus, were killed in a suicide attack by the Islamic State. A report. The Inter-Services Intelligence ISI of Pakistan, which is extensively engaged in carrying out atrocities on minorities in order to ethnically cleanse them, raised its satanic game by several notches as it targeted and killed several prominent political and religious Sikh and Hindu leaders of Afghanistan who were on their way to meet the President Ashraf Ghani in the eastern province of Nangarhar. The attack that aimed at eliminating the reasonable minority voices killed the sole Sikh candidate who was to contest in the October elections. It's very shocking, including uh, the loss of Uttar Singh, who was the candidate for the upcoming election. It is an attack on the Afghan democracy, attack on the Afghan values, freedom of religion, faith, and attack on our diversity. Islamabad, the real perpetrator of terror in Afghanistan, cannot stand the fact that minorities are getting empowered across the globe, has launched a covert operation in order to ethnically cleanse them. While condemning the attack and asking the Indian and Afghani government to work in coherence, Manjeet Singh GK, President of Delhi Sikh Gurdwara Management Committee, categorically called it a diabolic agenda of people sitting across the border. The 11 people who have been killed, they are the presidents of uh, Gurdwaras, the main Gurdwaras, the historical and other places. They are s s political, social, and religious leaders of Afghanistan who have been killed. So I think uh, the total leadership of Afghanistan is, is, is uh, you know, has, we have lost the leadership in this attack, in this barbaric attack, and we want that government of India should take stern action to make sure the Hindus and Sikhs living in Afghanistan of their security. People in India, home to both Sikh and Hindu religions, took to the streets condemning the targeted killings of people of their faiths. They also urged their own government to expeditiously engage in providing them a safe atmosphere. Meanwhile, reaching out to the families of victims, Indian External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj assured all possible assistance to the grieving families. हम ये चाहते हैं कि उनको अगर उनके पासपोर्टों में प्रॉब्लम है आने की दिक्कत है टिकट की दिक्कत है ये सारी प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व की जाए वो आत्मकर्ती हमले दे नाल वो सारे सिख जड़े ने मारे गए ने जी दे नाल सारे सिखां दे हृदय ने जड़े वो बुलंदरे गए ने मैं समझना कि सिख ऐसी कौम है जिथे भी सिख बस दे ने वो अपनी मेहनत दे नाल और अपनी जड़ी पहचान आप बनाउंदे ने उथे जिथे भी रहंदे ने उथे देश दे विच भी मैं समझना उना दा ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤਰੱਕੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਯੋਗਦਾਨ ਆਪਣਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਜਿਸ ਉਥੋਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਾਨ ਮਾਲ ਦੀ ਰਾਖੀ ਕਰਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਹਿਫਾਜ਼ਤ ਕਰਨ The situation of Sikhs and Hindus in Pakistan especially those living in areas bordering Afghanistan is not good A month ago prominent Sikh leader Charanjit Singh Sagar was shot dead in Peshawar city of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan the minority Sikh and Hindu community in Pakistan remains a frequent target of Pakistani Taliban and secret agencies and the majority of these families have been forced to migrate to Europe and India. After the deadly attack, members of Sikh and Hindu communities are torn between converting to Islam and relocating to India. Moving on. Prime Minister of Bhutan, the country with which India shares a special bond and relationship, came to New Delhi on three-day visit to further bolster the bilateral ties. The visit came in the line of India and Bhutan celebrating the 50 years of establishment of bilateral relationship. Have a look.
Junior Minister of Indian External Affairs V K Singh received Bhutanese Prime Minister Dasho Sereng Topge as he arrived in New Delhi on a three-day visit to further bolster an already well-established relationship between two countries. Indian External Minister Shushma Saraj held bilateral talks with the leader and discussed various ways in which the relationship could further be deepened. Celebrating the visit, official spokesperson for Indian External Affairs Ministry termed the relationship between the exceptional and also assured that the talks between the countries were going to take the relationship to the newer heights. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi accorded him a warm welcome in the Hyderabad House in the Indian capital, New Delhi. Both the leaders held extensive talks and reviewed entire gamut of bilateral relations. It is being assumed that both the leaders also held talks regarding the Doklam, over which a more than 70-day standoff had persisted between India and China. Both leaders led the delegation-level talks, which essentially discussed all the issues of mutual interest. In the 2012-2013 fiscal report, India's contribution to Bhutan totaled up to 600 million US dollar. Over the years, it steadily increased to total 985 million US dollar in 2015-2016. India-Bhutan Trade and Transit Agreement of 1972 established a free trade regime between them. According to the agreement, it provides for duty-free transit of Bhutan's exports to third countries. Most of Bhutan's exports go to India and its imports come from India. In 2016, Bhutan exported goods worth of Rs 3,205 crore, while imports received from India amounted to Rs 5,529 crore. India and Bhutan share traditionally good diplomatic relations which have been sustained by regular visits and high-level dialogues between the two nations. In 2014, Prime Minister Narendra Modi selected Bhutan as his first official foreign visit. At the time of his visit, it had been six years since an Indian Prime Minister had set foot in Bhutanese soil. Much of ties between the two countries stem from the culture shared by the two. Bhutan has proved to be a steadfast ally and has on more than one occasion demonstrated its respect for India. Moving on, Pakistan is gearing up to vote on July 25 as the ruling Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz PMLN party handed over the power to a technocratic caretaker administration after completing a full five-year term. But as campaigning begins, tensions between the civilian politicians and the powerful military, which has ruled country for about half of the Pakistan's history since 1947, are running high. We have a report. Election campaigning is in full swing in Pakistan. 29-year-old Bilawal Bhutto Zardari of Pakistan's People's Party, who is aspiring to be the next Prime Minister of Pakistan, makes his appearance in Karachi city. Bilawal's mother, the two-time Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, was assassinated on the campaign trial and his grandfather, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was executed by a military dictator. Now, Oxford-educated Bilawal is trying to revive the fortune of his struggling party. Despite the feel-good feeling in the crowds, election time is always tense in Pakistan, which has been ruled by the military for almost half of the 70 years since independence. Fear is used as a, as a political tactic in Pakistan, yeah. uh, and at the moment uh, particularly, uh, there is a sense of fear and insecurity uh, across the country for political activists, which shouldn't be the case, uh, because the Pakistan People's Party believes that there should be uh, peaceful, free and fair elections in the country, and such uh, a climate of fear uh, doesn't allow for that. My goal or my aim isn't just about uh, power or becoming Prime Minister, but our, our, our crowd our receptions have been overwhelming that um, provides us with the confidence to believe that we in a free and fair election will do well. The outgoing Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz government has accused the military and courts of playing a role in the ouster of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif last year and helping Imran Khan's Pakistan Tariq Saf political party. And overshadowing all this is the fear that the election is being engineered by the establishment, a euphemism for Pakistan's much-feared military and intelligence top brass along with some senior civil servants and judges. The military has repeatedly denied that it interferes in modern-day politics. A pre-election assessment report published recently by an independent think tank, Pakistan Institute of Legislative Development and Transparency, deemed the pre-poll process to have been unfair overall in the 12 months before the election was called. 
think tank said surreptitious muzzling of the media, a rise in bias from the military establishment and a perceived partisanship in judicial and political accountability have nearly eroded the prospects of a free and fair election in 2018. Pakistan has a history of having conflicts among the political parties and the military. We are now joined by Nadeem Nusrat, a Pakistani-American politician, to share his views on the current situation. Mr. Nusrat, what is your assessment of allegations by political parties in Pakistan over growing interference of military in the upcoming polls? Well, based on uh, the information and what um, we have been observing in the social media, it's pretty clear that um, pre-poll rigging in Pakistan is in full swing. Um, there is not just one or two pieces of evidence. There are literally hundreds of thousands. We all know how Pakistan's electronic and print media is, um, is completely under threat from Pakistani military establishment and they are finding it very hard to report facts. On the other hand, if you um, start exploring the social media, you will find that um, there are hundreds of videos available where the candidates are complaining that they have been visited by the men in uniform and they are being threatened. There is a word uh, which is used for um, intelligence agencies uh, called aliens or um, a creature from um, an outer planet. They are visiting and <clears throat> if you look at uh, how things are uh, progressing um, towards 25th of July. Uh, Imran Khan's PTI is clearly a favorite of uh, Pakistani military establishment and it is being afforded uh, the status accordingly. Um, its candidates are uh, being um, scrutinized um, um, in a jiffy on the other hand the um, the candidates belonging to uh, Muslim League and other political parties are having a tough time. We all know that how uh, Chaudhary Nisar Ali Khan, who uh, was the interior minister during the time of uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, and he is supposed to be very close to uh, Pakistan's military agency called ISI. Uh, he is running um, a his election campaign as an independent cam, uh, candidate and he has been given the electoral symbol of Jeep. And now we are uh, hearing reports from uh, Punjab province that intelligence agencies personnel are visiting candidates belonging to Muslim League Noon, Mr. Nawaz Sharif's party. And these candidates are being forced to withdraw um, their nomination or return party ticket and then join um, or run election campaign as an independent candidate and use the symbol of Jeep. So we can see clearly emergence of uh, a mysterious uh, group in, in the upcoming election. Thank you, Mr. Nusrat. Let's talk about Nepal, where hundreds of Hindu pilgrims undertaking Kailash Mansarovar Yatra to Tibet got stranded owing to heavy torrential rains that have already disrupted normal life across South Asia. A massive rescue operation launched soon after has successfully evacuated more than 100 people. The operation has further been intensified by Indian assistance at all fronts. A report. After hours of struggle and some uncommon efforts by rescue teams, the first lot of civilians who got stranded and rode annual pilgrimage to Tibet owing to incessant rains reached airport. Proving the inclement weather and treacherous landscapes, Nepal teams with an active support from Indian personnel successfully rescued over 100 people in first round. The Nepalese army had deployed military choppers including MI-17 for the rescue work and also operated a few commercial flights in order to intensify the mission of saving people. The Indian authorities, spearheaded by the foreign ministry and various state governments, also stepped up the efforts and brought back around 200 pilgrims stranded in the Simicord area. The priority was being given to the sick and the elderly, said the spokesperson of the Nepal Army. Today's rescue operation, Nepalese Army's uh, MI-17, it rescued 
till now two flights that is 45 percent from Simicode to Biryanagar Surkhet. So our our priority uh, our flight is the priority flight uh, flight. So what we are doing is those who are sick, elderly aged people, we are evacuated these people from Simicode to the uh, Surkhet. Easily 400 to 500 people are still stuck in Hilsa and Simicot. And this is a problem because many of them are heart patients, many of them are suffering from altitude sickness, and this is causing a major chaos and panic among the Yatris. Owing to systematically organized mission, no casualty was reported from the camps at even highest of altitudes. Medical assistance was also being provided to those with heart sicknesses and other ailments. The Indian mission has asked all door operators in the region to try and hold pilgrims back in Tibet's site as far as possible. Thousands of Indians travel to Kailash and Mansarovar in Tibet every year. The Kailash Mansarovar Yatra is of religious and cultural significance for Hindus, Jains and Buddhists. In 2015, China agreed at Prime Minister Narendra Modi's request to let Indians access the mountain, considered the airport of Lord Shiva through the Natula Pass, which is a relatively easier route than through a pass in Indian state of Uttarakhand. Moving on to Bangladesh, where Rohingya refugees are living under a constant shadow of death owing to abysmal living conditions in refugee camps of the Cox's Bazar. Their plight have compounded with the onset of monsoon season. With heavy rainfall expected this year, thousands who have been living here since fleeing a military crackdown in Myanmar last year are poised to face the imminent wrath of nature. A report. Amid a looming hazardous situation, more than a thousand helpless families are living in camps on a thin strip of land with no basic facilities between Myanmar and Bangladesh. They have been living on the embankment of Tombru Canal, which divides the two countries. Monsoon has worsened their living environment by damaging their camps. The harsh conditions have forced the refugees to rethink their decision to stay. Threatened by the weather forecast of coming few days, Noor Aisha, a worried mother, is planning to relocate herself to another camp. <laughs> There are other hurdles as well. Though the refugees have received food and some shelter from aid agencies, their other needs are hardly satisfied. About 10 people have died since they moved to the border area. Of those, two were children who died of diarrhea and pneumonia. A pregnant woman and her baby died as there was no medical facility available. Mohammad Rafiq, a Rohingya refugee, said that they live in fear every day as the security forces have been asking them to vacate the land. Many are essentially leaving here with the hope that they will be the first ones to be repatriated. However, though talks are on to send back the ones stuck in the no man's land around the border, nothing concrete has yet come out. Meanwhile, Peter Mora, the president of International Committee of the Red Cross, after visiting the ruined villages of Rakhine State, arrived at the refugee camps of Cox's Bazar. Mora spoke with refugees as well as ICRC workers in the camps. He said from what he had witnessed, it is a lose-lose situation on both sides of the border. Of course, everybody hopes that you can somehow, as soon as possible, re-establish some normalcy, which would create conditions conducive to return. It's not only an issue of whether a government wants to take people back, it's also the question whether the conditions are uh, ripe to have people back in safety and dignity, uh, to go back uh, well informed of what ex actually the situation is, and and there I think there is still a lot, uh, a lot of work to do for humanitarian organisations. Where the end is of this, I don't know. I would suspect and. From what I have seen this morning, what I have seen over the last couple of days in Myanmar is that we are in 
for the medium and long term and not for the short term. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya have crossed the border to Bangladesh in just over 10 months after they were forced to leave their homes following an army crackdown triggered by insurgents' attacks on security forces. UN Human Rights Council says the exodus is still very much on with more than 11,000 people crossing the border and taking refuge in Bangladesh this year. Moving on to India, where in a first of its kind, women are being trained to compete at prime level of the motor racing. Ahura Racing, a professional racing team founded by the three-time winner of national championship Sarosha Hataria, has not only provided a platform to the women enthusiasts to train and compete, but also dream big. A report. Over 60 women from various parts of India have stepped forward to showcase their talent in an event organized by Ahura Racing to form the country's first all-women motor racing team for Chikitar National Racing Championship. This event evidently reflected the enthusiasm among all participants for receiving such an opportunity for the first time. Women from multiple professions participated in this event. Since last one and a half year, I have been doing certain off-road events, certain rallies, and uh, been fortunate enough to have podiums in them. And it's, it's overall a very good experience because there's a lot of adrenaline flow, you need a lot of courage, you have to overcome your fear, and then you have to get onto the track and win. So that's amazing. It's one of the nicest feelings one can have. Car racing is a sport which requires a lot of discipline, concentration and commitment. The organizers provided both technical and mechanical support to train the participants for this championship. After sweating out for three days at Karimoto Speedway track in southern Coimbatore city, six women were selected to showcase their passion at Chikitar National Racing Championship. The 60 odd women come from all walks of life, doctors, engineers, moms. It's absolutely a beautiful experience to be here and we have to thank Sarosh for this, for making it happen for bringing us all together, training us, helping us understand what this sport is. A lot of us have a passion to do this, but there are so many technicalities, so many little things that we have learned in the last three days. And we have to owe that all to Sarosh and thank him very much. It is a sport that is exciting and it needs a lot of discipline, a lot, uh, sorry, excuse me, a lot of, uh, you know, concentration, a lot of commitment. In sport, racing is a competition of speed. Just seen in women to excel in racing as a sport has encouraged the organizers to provide more such opportunities to them and take this sport to the next level. India has been organizing such encouraging championship for a while now, but this was the first time when something like this was organized for women. India is the home of one of the current Formula One teams, Force India, but the team's base is in the UK. There are currently no Indian Formula One drivers. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Take care and goodbye.